Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very daunting task to move outside your comfort zone, and there are two people in the audience I need to blame for that, and I'll get back to them uh, later. But it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. And if there's one message to take home, it is that the trust does have 16 billion pounds. I have not found the key yet, but, but I will. Um, and it gives away about 750 million pounds a year. Now, traditionally, that's been given to people like me. I'm a doctor, I'm a scientist. But increasingly, it's obvious, particularly in the globalized world, which I'll come back to, that the solutions will not necessarily come from people that look like me or have had my training, but they will come from other communities. And the reason for coming and being so nervous after those presentations earlier is to reach out to your sort of community who are more likely, I think, and certainly having listened to those talks earlier today, inspired by, more likely potentially to have those innovative, creative, game-breaking thoughts that our scientific community may not have. And so if the lure of 750 million does nothing to you, I hope it will, and I hope to see people like you after this meeting and over the coming months and years coming to the trust with those sorts of wacky ideas that have never even featured in a clinician biomedical scientist idea. Now, after me, there were two actually brilliant biomedical scientists from oncology, genetics, and, and the funny way of doing them with mosquitoes. But, but it is them and people like you that we want to get together. So if there's anything we can do to help that, you know where we are or you know where to find us. And thank you very much for the invitation. So I first came to the UK as a young lad 30 or 40 years ago, I won't divulge that properly, and I got on a boat in Asia for the first time and I came to London. I, I came and arrived uh, in Southampton. It took seven weeks to get here. If I got onto that boat with <coughs> something <coughs> nasty, by the time I'd got off in London, I would either have been dead or I'd have recovered from that cough. The world has now changed, and two or three weeks ago, before I started the trust, I left Asia very, very close to where I left 40, 30, 40 years ago. And I got an airplane at 9 o'clock in the evening, and I was here on the Paddington train that takes you to Paddington from Heathrow the following morning at 6.30 in the morning. And that has changed the nature of, emerging, of infectious diseases and emerging diseases. Many of you will have seen the film Contagion, and actually, whatever you may think of the film, the science behind it was superb. It actually told a very, very good story. And the main character in that got on a plane in Hong Kong and traveled to North America. And actually, that's exactly what happened 10 years ago in a sort of life-defining moment for me when I was involved in SARS at first hand and then bird flu very soon after that. And I can tell you, and this is personal experience, 10 years later, it's almost exactly to the day, in fact, how frightening that is. It truly is frightening. I was working in a Vietnamese government hospital. The nearest intensive care unit was many hours away on a flight. Uh, within actually four hours flight of Ho Chi Minh City live more than 60% of the world's population and more than 80% of the world's chickens. And they live very, very close together. And SARS came out of southern China. Before it was known, it spread to actually to northern Vietnam. And a very good friend of mine, Carlo Urbani, who was working in Hanoi at the time, uh, decided that he was seeing something unusual in a hospital in Hanoi and shut the place and didn't let anybody in or anybody out and as a result lost his life. And when I was working in Ho Chi Minh City at the time and when we went through the same things myself, can you, it's very difficult to get across how terrifying that is. You're working in a hospital, you're seeing people with coughs, you don't know who's got SARS and who doesn't, you've no way of distinguishing this and do you go home at night? Do you stay in the hospital? Do you shut the hospital? You know that if you contract it, you've got about a 70% chance of dying. It raises all sorts of issues about your own, own ethics, your own attitude to your profession, your own attitude to the patients in front of you. And I can tell you that is the most frightening experience I've ever, ever been through. That was exactly 10 years ago today. And many of you, I think some of you, will have come from North America, from Toronto. London, for some reason, escaped that. London had no cases. But Toronto suffered hugely. With many, many deaths, it stopped the city and, and, and uh, caused billions of dollars and pounds worth of, of damage. Those emerging infections have not gone away. We've no idea where SARS actually went. It came out of a civet cat. It got across to humans. We've no understanding of that biology at that interface. You think of yourself a human being, and most of you probably are, but part of you, deep down here in your lungs, 
for those of you who don't know where your body is, these are your lungs. Deep down here, you, you've retained a little bit of being a chicken. And so although we think that there's a species barrier between you and a chicken, actually, don't be fooled, there's not that much of a species barrier. So in the deep lungs in your tissue, there are receptors there to which chicken viruses combine, can, 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 uh, can add to that receptor, and they can get into the human body. And that is what has driven HIV in the Democratic Republic of Congo sometime in the 20th century, repeated of episodes which came across to humans until eventually that virus learned how to live in a human being. And the HIV epidemic is one of the great stories of emerging infections which we've now lived with and think of the costs to society and to people of that infection. And think of the 1918 so-called Spanish flu. 60, 40 to 60 million people died at a time the population of the world was about a third of what it is now. Extrapolate that to today and the fact that I could travel on an airplane and be with you tomorrow uh, and think what that may happen with an emerging infection. If you think who you're sitting next to in the room today and where they were two days ago and where they will be in a couple of days' time, you could be certainly the spread. And certainly medical conferences are one of the best ways of spreading infectious diseases globally. Um, and presumably your connected world is even more so. Um, so globalization has changed the speed at which these things happen. And our capacity to deal with that is all predicated on a system and structure that was established after the Second World War, the World Health Organization. And they are still in that mindset, just as actually the financial world is ruled by the IMF and the World Bank in mechanisms that were established post-Second World War. They really are no longer fit for purpose for the 21st century. And their ability to respond uh, quickly and sensibly and, and pragmatically is very, very restricted. And, and there's a major question about whether we have the systems and structures to, to cope with that. We don't understand the biology. I can't tell you which virus will jump across the, to the human being from a chicken. And I can't tell you which one will jump once, as is currently happening in the Middle East. There's a new virus you may or may not have heard of called the uh, Middle East uh, uh, respiratory virus, which is very similar to SARS and is currently circulating in the Middle East, we have no idea of judging whether that will die out and you'll all be cynical and say, I warned you, but I cried wolf, or it's the same as was happening in southern China and Vietnam in 2002, 2001, prior to the outbreak of SARS. I have no way of knowing that, and nor does anybody else. And that inability to be able to predict the future is a huge challenge. Um, the purpose of this coming here is to try and persuade you that in there, there are some solutions to be found. And can I, I've just got, I don't have any PowerPoint slides. That's another remarkably frightening thing to do uh, when you come from a scientific world, not to talk to PowerPoint slides. But I do have one video. You'll be more aware of it than I am. Can I just show the video, uh, at least the image now? This is, will work seamlessly. Could I show the video? That's brilliant. So you will be aware of this. This is Twitter feeds, 350 million Twitter feeds a day. The blob on the far right, as you're looking at it, uh, is Indonesia. And this is seven hours of Twitter feeds. Can you just play the video now? And what you can see is this is how the world changes. It starts in Asia, very like an emerging infection, and slowly it spreads around the world. But the interesting things are, the bright lights, of course, are, are where most Twitter feeds are happening. This is 350 million Twitter feeds a day. There are 5 billion, in a single search engine, Google, there are 5 billion searches done a day, and China is going to expand that massively. Just think of the data, and I know you heard about some of this yesterday, the data that could potentially, if we sort out ethics and we sort out uh, uh, everything else that goes with it. The data that you could mine from that. And even if that only bought a short time, one or two weeks of knowing from Twitter or Google or any of the other search engines that something was happening before the medical community knew about it, there is a possibility of intervening. And so I know you heard yesterday and I'm re somewhere repeating it today. If we can somehow work with your sort of creative world to use this sort of data and to mine that in a way that can help biology understand its processes and to help, in my case, emerging infectious diseases, but could be true in oncology and genetics and mosquitoes later, we would be all advanced by that. So I go back to my original point. There is 750 million pounds, a billion dollars to give away. I've found the key to the 750 million. I have not yet found the key to 16 billion, but it's only a matter of time. And we would dearly love to work more with your communities and we hope uh, to see all of you somewhere in the Wellcome Trust or somewhere um, in the near future. So thank you very much.
uh, and I look forward to the rest of the talks.